The fact that the town of Midland, near the south end of Georgian Bay, came into being during a depression in the late 1800s is some evidence of the durability of its people. They woke up one morning to the announcement that the Midland Railway, chasing after the grain handling trade, would develop the site as a shipping and lumbering center. Now that should be the beginning of our story, right? Well, not quite. The history of this area called Huronia is a little more complicated than that. The nearby former British naval site at Penetanguishene is a part of it, of course. It was a major base during the War of 1812. But there is something here that goes back a lot further than that. For years, historians and archeologists have been piecing together the saga of what, in fact, is the site of first European settlement in Ontario. The communities of Midland, and St. Marie Among the Hurons are the subject of this episode of Sketches of Our Town. The Coast Guard icebreaker Griffin sits in home port on a brief layover. The ship is symbolic of this harbor town's position along the Great Lakes. Situated in what was at one time called Mundy's Bay, Midland lies in Simcoe County, whose townships include Tiny and Tay, names inherited from Lady Simcoe's pet hounds. The fact that there is an easy street in town has a more practical connotation, a route up the steep hillside in winter. It is not a comment on Midland's beginnings, for its boom and bust cycles have challenged the best. The only thing easy about it was the area's ability to attract fireblood characters in search of a dream. Mary Haskell has devoted years to the study of the community's history. Mary, you described this town of Midland uh, let me get it straight, as an entrepreneur's town. What, yeah. what do you mean by that? Well, the town was organized by businessmen to take advantage of the number of things that were coming together at that particular time. Railroads were starting in Canada. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginning of steam power. And the West was being settled and planted to wheat. And they were beginning to discover that there were minerals north of Superior. And Midland was organized for no other reason than to have the best harbor on Georgian Bay. Yeah. So when did the railway come? Railway came in 1879, but they decided in 1872 that this was going to be the terminus. And at that time, there were five shacks here. That's the way they were described, with some people eking out a living. Well, who decided that the railway was going the to railway, come there? This was the railway company, which was under the presidency of Adolf Hugel, who later became known as Baron von Hugel. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where the title came from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, well, where was he located? He was located in Port Hope. Port Hope had a dream, living along the front, mm -hmm. that and that they would build a railway into the back country, develop all the riches in the Halliburton area and along Georgian Bay, tap the riches further north in Muskoka, and tap all this wonderful freight that was going to come down from the head of the lakes and would build a railroad. The railroad came along, but in the meantime, plans were being made for the elevators because the elevators were finished the same time as the first elevators at the lakehead. So what happened then? Midland boomed in a way you wouldn't believe. 
anyone who came to Midland immediately established a business and flourished. Mm -hmm. One man came up from Barry in a wagon with his six children and his wife and two barrels of flour, which immediately break, baked into bread and sold it within a week. <laughs> and this is the way business went. Yeah. You just couldn't keep up with it. It was a boom. The domestic and offshore appetite for lumber had been the motivation for pre-railway speculators with an eye on the huge timber limits of Georgian Bay. It was said to have been the largest of its kind along the shoreline, the steam-powered mill set up by H.H. H. Cook. But foreseeing a downturn in the market, unable to hang on until the railway came to replace the seasonal schooner, he began selling his holdings, his mill going to the British Canadian Lumber Company, and it soon folded. Mr. Cook was no fool either. He sold them a lot of timber limits. They were completely inaccessible. <laughs> the bank took over the British Canadian Lumber Company, and they found themselves with a bay full of logs that had to be made into timber. Mm -hmm. So they hired, um, through a Mr. and Miss Campbell, who seems to be involved with most of the mills in Simp Cook County, yeah. one way or another, and he hired a young man by the name of James Playfair. And that's our old Jimmy, who was the main man to keep put Midland on the tracks to prosperity. Right. Oh. Uh, he seemed to be a man that could see opportunity ahead. For instance, he did very well with the sawmill. But about 1916, he realized that the glory days of lumbering were over. You cut a tree mm -hmm. down, you wait another 100 years. Mm -hmm. So at that point, he ripped down his mills and built the shipyard and began building ships for the British Navy. And that established the Midland Shipyard. Playfair's faith in the future proved to be the lifeblood of the community. Ships coming out of the boatworks were soon plying the lakes, carrying coal and grain. The hubbub in town became focused on the docks, where the railway was a jumping off point for passengers and the shipping of goods ran at its peak. For the town, there was no looking back. That dock area was just a center of money and power. Incredible they needed place. coal, they built their own coal dock. Yeah. Those were our glory days when the harbor did it. Uh, you have a story about the first ship that came in here. The minute the, the elevator was ready, there was a shipment of grain came in from Chicago for transshipment, and the man who unloaded it did so with pails, passed one to the other. <laughs> <laughs> and the load of grain that came in on that ship was considered a good load. And it would just fill a corner, one of the great upper lakers, right. the grain carriers that come yeah. now. It was a proud town, and everyone was proud of the companies and their work, and they had a workforce of very highly skilled people. Uh, maybe not highly educated, we had men who couldn't read, but they had skills with their hands and their brains and mm -hmm. the very loyal, hard-working workforce. Another industry that kept things busy was fitting out the boats, because when the shipping was at its peak, you could walk right across Midland Bay on the decks of the boats from one shore to the other. And they would need a lot of provisioning, we, wouldn't they? The stores at that end of the town, and that end of the town was the center of the business. That was the heart of the business of Midland at the foot of yeah. King Street. And the people worked all night frequently. There's a day shift and a night shift when those boats were fitting out. Mm -hmm. Or if a ship came in and was sailing during the night, they would work right through the night if they needed tools or Jeffrey's hardware. Frequently had a night staff on to, fit, to supply those boats with their needs. I would expect when uh, ships docked here in those numbers, the crews coming ashore dropped a fair amount of money into the economy of Midland and the restaurants and the... the restaurants, boarding uh, houses. Revelry and, places. And hotels, yes. Revelry places. There's a story of Captain Morden of the Morden Lines who operate around early 1900. He wouldn't mm -hmm. have liquor on his boat, nor a man who was drunk. So one time, a big portion of his crew arrived at the dock to sail, inebriated, and he just sailed off and left them there. <laughs> so man they, of his word. They had to stay there with no money, nothing, no clothing, until he made his trip back. So they're very sober and very annoyed. 
and they were going to beat the stuffing out of the old man, but all he had to do was walk out of the cabin, all six feet of him, and he God. was the old man, and they didn't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> And something here on a specialized craft, thriving in an age of technology. Close to Midland is an operation that continues in the tradition of building boats, but not just any kind. The work is an art form, and the artist is one dedicated man, Vic Carpenter. Why are you making wooden boats? Well, I've always liked wood. I prefer it. I actually think it's a better material, and as long as I can keep you know, busy messing with wood. I don't want to, you know, putty around in the plastic. You, t <laughs> you tell me that your boats, your wooden boats, are the ones that are maintenance-free, not the plastic ones. So that's right. Uh, like this boat was built nine years ago, and it's had one coat of varnish on it last week and all that time. Do you do a, a lot of restoring boats, uh, these vintage boats like this one? We prefer to build the new ones yeah. that we design, or we have did uh, replicas, too. That's what this is, isn't it? We used to. Yes, this is a replica of a 1931 Minette. We restored the original and then built this replica. Oh, yeah. The steering wheel's made here. It's all handmade, and the fittings, being it's a, it's a replica boat, there's no fittings for it, so we mm -hmm. manufacture them. We duplicate them all like the originals, only in stainless steel. Do you specs for them, or? Uh, well, we've. You look at one of the, uh, we've got, the original. That's right. We've got the original fittings or photographs of the old boat. Yeah. How long would it take to, to make a boat like this? We made it through the winter months. Yeah. This is very special wood. Where do you get it? I mean, it's all matched. The, the, you mentioned the little nut the yeah. whirl on the side of the, the light here is matched over there. Well, it's book matched. That means the boards, if, if it's on the, you know, the left and right side, they're resawed out of a thicker mm -hmm. piece, so they're Danny Cohen. Where do you get that wood? The mahogany comes from uh, South America or Honduras, and the ebony is from Africa. Do you get it from there, or do you have no. a... We get it from... Uh, importers who bring it in, whoever may have it, you know, the quality that we want. So somebody hears that they've got this, somebody's got this and they hear that, or they know that Vic Carpenter's always in the market for some Yeah, I, I'm always in the market, I guess. <laughs> I'm always planning another boat, so. <laughs> On the outskirts of town is the opportunity to peer behind the curtain of time, catching a glimpse into the period of first European contact with those native to North America. Although maps of ancient Huronia do exist, the locations of the native villages on them are largely guesses based on letters sent home by the early missionaries. In the North Simcoe section of Huronia here, there are the sites of more than 400 Indian villages. Among the known ones are St. Ignace here, Ignace 1 and 2, uh, St. Louis is here. Down on Lake Simcoe it's Kayakwe, which is believed to have been one of the major centers of the whole Huron nation. Just east of Midland, on the Wye River, was a site that was easily identified because it never really disappeared. Various people, among them Lord Simcoe in his diary of 1793, made mention of the site of the old French ruins. In the 1930s, a movement began which ultimately resulted in the reconstruction of this site, St. Mary Among the Hurons. It now stands as a monument to an episode of heroism and humanity pushed to extremes. The old French ruins would prove to be a fortified mission and headquarters built by the Jesuit Order of France at a Huron village 350 years ago. The purpose of the fathers, to bring Christianity to the native peoples. It would take over a century and a half of sustained ambition of many to eventually see a reconstructed community rise from the ashes. Henry Vandervoort. 
St. Marie began in 1639 with a single bu building, uh, a few priests um, and a handful of uh, uh, donnés in French to give or to donate. And they gave their services freely to the Jesuit fathers and they received in kind uh, food, shelter and clothing. St. Marie would grow slowly between 1639 and 1642 with some um, 18 individuals uh, being present at St. Marie by 1642. What happened is St. Marie um, expanded into a native area uh, initially where a hospital and a church was built for the native people as well as um, a longhouse for those who wished to stay for a few days or a few weeks depending on uh, what their needs were. The North Court, uh, as we call it today because of its uh, geographic location, um, uh, shows there where you have the cookhouse, the residences, the blacksmith shop, the carpenter shop, the barn and stables area where the animals were kept. The chickens uh, would uh, go where they pleased and usually they knew where to roost. An interesting story of uh, the Jesuits asking the Hurons not to speak so loudly and uh, the Hurons pointing out that that certain bird, the rooster, was far louder than they were. And they should talk to the bird before they talk to them. The primary diet was uh, fairly vegetarian. 65% uh, of their diet was corn. In fact, their diet was very similar to that of the natives. Only the way it was prepared was somewhat different. Uh, the uh, the uh, Huron had about 20 different ways they prepared corn, and the French probably didn't like 19 of those ways. So uh, thank goodness they had uh, Amboise Boué, uh, their chef, and uh, who prepared uh, cornbread uh, to the uh, European liking, a little flat and uh, rather heavy. Wendake, meaning in the islands, was the name the Huron, or Wendat people, called their country. It is believed that they numbered about 30,000. They were agriculturalists who would trade corn and squash for the game and furs of northern tribes. The priests came to rely on the native people for survival, but their presence drew increased hostility from the Iroquois to the south. Subsequent warfare created heavy losses, but it would be smallpox, unwittingly carried by the black robes, that would ultimately decimate their population. From this period, Father Jean de Brebeuf would be immortalized. It's interesting with uh, Father Jean de Brebeuf, he believed himself to um, be fit only to carry heavy loads, that he did not deserve the privilege of being a priest. He played with his name saying Freybeuf, or rather Brebeuf, meaning ox-like. He uh, was an excellent linguist and uh, learned the language within a few years of his arrival. It was Father Brebeuf who wrote the French Huron and Latin dictionary, which would help many other Jesuits to learn the language to make them confident at their work and make their efforts more successful. Father Brebeuf also uh, worked diligently at learning their culture, at uh, understanding how they thought. He was also the most condescending towards the, the traditional native beliefs. Uh, he believed in the beauty of man, but he also felt that many of the things that they practiced or worship was to the demon or, or to the devil. And he believed his job was critical to save uh, those who uh, had not been baptized from eternal damnation. It was very black and white, and uh, although he showed a great, air, uh, great deal of flexibility when it came to uh, ad adopting and accepting their culture in order to bring the message home. By 1648, tensions were volatile. Those refusing to accept Christianity accused the black robes of dividing their nation. They questioned why the priests did not die from the spreading diseases. Yet the fathers would not let go. Soon, at the hands of the Iroquois, hundreds of Huron were killed. Four Jesuits, including Brebeuf, were martyred. The land was being emptied. And finally, in June 1649, Father Ragueneau wrote of St. Marie, we ourselves set fire to it and beheld the burning before our eyes. In less than one hour, our work of 10 years. The reconstructed St. Marie 
is built in the spirit of those men whose individual efforts um, uh, were the reason for many of their successes. But St. Marie is also uh, in memory as an epitaph to the some 30,000 Hurons who once lived in this country, and we should not forget them either, for they have contributed greatly uh, throughout Canadian history and should be recognized as so. It was a very fast period of history. History seems to be quite slow sometimes, but at St. Marie it happened very quickly, and in Canadian history it is most unique. When James Playfair came to Midland from his native Scotland, he was but a young man with a basic education and a keen mind. He was just 19 when he started working in the lumber mills for $12 a month. Eventually, he went on to shape the town's future, becoming an important benefactor. Playfair's accomplishments are the stuff of storybooks. It has been more than a century since this community was incorporated. Not all of the stories of those caught up in the fancy of a Midland city ended like Playfair's, for there were no guarantees. It was an entrepreneur's town. What is important is that they were people of courage and ingenuity who acted upon them, accomplishments in their own right. Etched into the landscape of Huronia, as we have seen, are the themes that are a part of the foundation of this country. Religion, trade and commerce, exploiting natural resources. Etched into the character of the people here is a spirit of making things work. As Mary Haskell would put it, the Midland spirit. You can't help but come away with a deeper sense and understanding of the effort, the gambles, the sacrifices that have gone into building a society that today, by comparison, has it pretty good. And if there is ever any question about the preservation and the making visible of our history, the answer to that question lies in our simple appreciation of it. I'm Harvey Kirk. <laughs>